Hello and welcome to the people tuning in right now. I am Irdina Isha, and this is Finding Your Power. I invited a special someone. She, in fact, still doesn't know why I invite her, and I question that too. <laughs> But actually, I look up to her in terms of how she carries herself, and she, in fact, studied human development science at University Putra Malaysia, and I think she's very qualified for today's topic, which we we're gonna talk about later. But first, Ru Ying. We have Ru Ying, guys. She's from Ru. AYTP2, Astro Young Talent Program. She's one of my batchmates. So, Ru Ying, do you want to say anything to our viewers? Hi, everyone. Um, not me just talking to a camera right here. So, really, really excited to be on this uh, episode today. Thanks so much for inviting me. First time being on air. Ooh. For today, actually, we are going to talk about a very serious issue that is sometimes overlooked in society. And that is depression. Now, the reason why I brought you today, actually, Ru Ying, is because I noticed during our first week at Astro, you are someone who often laugh, like you laugh a lot. And I once read a psychology psychology fact. It's like a person who is actually sad or lonely or depressed, maybe <laughs> that person would laugh a lot to hide. What they are going through. Wow! Uh, yeah. Wow! We're starting right off with that cliche. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but but uh, here's the interesting fact: Rui and I, we've never really sat down with each other and talk about things. I I've never known you personally, mm -hmm. so this is this is the chance for us to open up to each other. That's what well, I like. You know, that's what I like talking about feelings <laughs> on camera. <laughs> <laughs> Having people know what we're talking about, yeah, yeah, that's her. <laughs> yeah, let's let's dive right in then. Okay, let's start. Um, so my first question to you is, Ring, have you ever felt depressed in your life before? Well, so the short answer is yes, okay. definitely. Um, the long answer is that I, who hasn't, right? Who has not felt depressed in their lives before? And I'm not talking about. Clinically depressed. Yeah, we're not talking about that. Even though that's that's completely valid as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're talking about like feelings of depression uh, for for some time in your life or period in your life, right? Mm -hmm. When you're going through struggles. So yeah, definitely, I have felt depressed before, and it can be incredibly isolating. Mm -hmm. I would say you are constantly in a battle with your own thoughts. It's as if there's this manifestation of so to speak, like a shadow of yourself. Mm. And, you know, it's like you're constantly in battle with it. And during this battle, you're shutting yourself off from the world. It's mm. just you versus yourself. So that's why I say that it can be quite isolating. When did you experience this? So from, you know, across the years, um, definitely there has been moments, slumps. So for example, in my first job, before that, uh, it was with my relationships. Mm. Um, and I think the first, but the first time that I've ever really like felt sort of depressed mm -hmm. um, at that time, but I wasn't aware of it, was when I was I think sixteen to seventeen. Oh wow, that's interesting. Okay. Yeah. So the reason that I call that like my sort of depressive period, I think mm -hmm. um, a lot of times, I think a lot of times, honestly, disclaimer here, a lot yeah. of teenagers or you know people, young adults, are going through this. They are like trying to transition from teenagehood to adulthood. So I think it's very, very normal to actually fall into this um, depression pit. So I think that's what happened as well. For me, it was because I was not only trying to go from, you know, teenagehood to adulthood, but at the same time, I was um, a national swimmer mm. that was trying to get out of the national sw system. Oh. Yeah. What what happened? What happened actually? <laughs> so um, a quick backstory: okay. I was a competitive swimmer since I was like five or six years old. Um, I did quite well during that 
like when I was really young, like when I was 11 or 12. And that's why I was invited to the national team by the time I was 13. So from the moment that I joined the national team, um, unfortunately, for ma- many, many reasons, I wasn't improving. You could say it was because of puberty. You know, I was growing long limbs and everything and it was getting awkward. Uh, you know, um, you could say that I was also developing pretty unhealthy uh eating habits or like relationship with food, I think that was a very, very big struggle for me. Um, At one point, I think I was definitely going through some form of like eating disorder. And it wasn't helped by the fact that I think that some of my teammates were bullying me for the for the size thing, because um, even as a child, I was I was definitely like um, bigger and taller than other girls my age Mm. so those combination didn't help I wasn't improving I was gaining weight I was just feeling really lonely I didn't really have a lot of friends in school I didn't have a lot of friends as well because um, going through this training and stuff I I didn't I couldn't be in school a lot of time I was gradually feeling more and more down Mm. and it was to the point where I was sort of crying almost every other day oh my god like just crying in my own room Um, feeling sorry for myself, feeling really lonely, feeling really isolated, right? So, um, yeah, that was was the period of when I was feeling depressed. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thank you for opening up, uh, Ruying. So, I'm here to make you feel less lonely, all right? I have my own story too, Mm -hmm. but it's a different reason than yours. I'm definitely not a swimmer like you. You're, You're an athlete. But for me, back then, it happened to me when I was... 15, mm. like late 15, that was during the the day when I got my results for my PMR, actually. Oh. I've always been raised in a family that uh, prioritized achievements more than anything. And that was the first time in my life where I kind of failed to meet expectations. And I went to a boarding school here. So if you go to a boarding school that is like f- a fully res- residential school, you're supposed to get straight A's actually and I got seven A's and one B (laughs) oh no I still remember that day like it happened yesterday because it was just so bad Um, when we went to the school I cried in the car because I I used my phone to text and see get my results right and then it showed yeah I got seven A's so when I when I went to the hall and now I was crying and I remember my dad just stepping stepping you know he's just backing up like he wanted to give me space but really he was just like trying to avoid that was not helping yeah all that yeah no and my mom and i we were walking side by side but all i could remember was her saying like when i was weeping i was sobbing she just told me well at least you're still human oh (laughs) oh no (laughs) at least you're still human and we didn't park our car that far though we didn't, we didn't park our car that far at all, but it felt like it, it felt like a 10-kilometer walk. Mm, mm, the longest walk. So, yeah, and as soon as I got home, I remember locking myself up in my room. Like you said, yeah. isolating, isolating from people. That was what I did. And I didn't want to eat. All I remember was listening to Joe Flizo's hair walk. <laughs> that, that was on the rise that day. <laughs> yeah, and then when the school opened... It just, it really didn't help with how my parents handled things. Yeah. yeah. And I remember, like, uh, my mom, she didn't really want to send me back to school. No way. She was just em- because you got <laughs> a B? Yeah, she was, like, embarrassed, uh, you know? So wow. I was like, oh. And then I remember, I really, I really wanted to hide from the world. Yeah. Like, back then, I had an FB account. I deactivated that oh, account. Oh, gosh. <laughs> The the peak of, you know, depression was, at yes. the time was, you know, to like disconnect entirely. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Yeah, and I, I just didn't want to be seen. But the way I, I think I finally got out of it is when I remembered my responsibility. I remembered the responsibilities that I have in school because I was a prefect. And I couldn't exactly hide myself from the world if I wanted to because being a prefect meant that you have to be a leader. So eventually you have to stand out. So my mm. next question to you is, Reem, how did you handle it? How did you f- get out of that phase? Right. I wouldn't say that, you know, I mean, I, I, ma- I imagine it's the same as you, right? Like you don't get out of depression just from like, you know, one day you, you, you've you changed. Okay. Yeah, one day you're okay. You know, one day you wake up, you're like, oh yeah, I'm fine now, I'm better. <laughs> it doesn't happen like that. So yeah. for me, I think my story heavily relied on the fact that... Um, 
I had a conversation with my sister. Oh. So one day we were calling. Um, she's she was living overseas already at that time. Mm-hmm. So it was like a routine sort of like video calls, her checking in to say, hey, what's going on? What's up? And then I immediately just started crying. Oh. Right? I was like crying. Okay. I was like crying about swimming. I was crying about school. And at that point, she was just like, Rowing, ah, do you know that you can actually quit swimming? Then I was like, what? Mind blown. <laughs> Mind blown. Because it was my whole life, right? Imagine I've been swimming since I was five, mm. all the way until I was like 16, nonstop, nonstop. And, then, and, and at that point, she was, the, she was the first person, the catalyst to recommending that, hey, look, you are stuck in a position where it's making you really, really unhappy for already a few long months. Mm. So maybe you can do something about it. Mm-hmm. I think that was the moment that uh, really kick-started, you know, my, my getting to know myself, um, this kind of journey, because that was like... Call. Yeah, it was a wake-up call, you know? It was like telling you, hey, you know, actually you can be in control of your life. Not not in a toxic positivity way, right? Not in a yeah, sense yeah. like, oh yeah, you need to just be happy and forget about it. It's more of like, okay, you know, it's facts. You are stuck in a position where you are really unhappy. What can we do now? Basically, how I got out of, of um, this whole depressive slump, I would definitely say is... Because I had family, or rather, like, I had people that I could really, really trust. Mm, Yeah. Okay, that support system. Yes, the support system. So, actually, I was going to say, like, back to your um, story about, you know, how your parents' reaction, I don't think they were really helpful. Actually, I think that this may be what our generation is struggling with um, when it comes to, like, mental health journeys, right? Is Mm. because our system was not designed to be... Uh, aware of mental health issues or to that's recognize true. it. I think that's true. That's <laughs> totally true. Yeah, so so what ends up is that, you know, people like your parents or my parents, um, at that time, they were not happy about it either. I mean, you can imagine I was a, you know, supposedly a national swimmer. I had, I was one of the best swimmers from uh, KL and uh, I've already been to like multiple countries for competitions. Okay, wait, should I get your autograph? Oh, <laughs> Nah, okay. no, no, no. I should be getting your autograph now. <laughs> no, okay. but yeah, you know, quite a, you know, high achievement, so-called high achievement swimmer, but I wanted to quit it all, mm. you know. And of course, they were really, really upset about it. My mom especially. And and I can imagine, like, it's like, you know, same situation here. It's like, you don't want to disappoint your parents, but you also need to do it for yourself, you know. Mm. I want to do the, the history of your family Are all your family members swimmers? My siblings are. My parents were not. They just decided to bring us to the pool one day because my sister uh, had asthma. So the doctor recommended swimming as a sport. Mm. And then from there, we were all just like, you know, jumping around in the water, feeling pretty happy. And then they were like, oh yeah, let's capitalize on this. Let's, Uh, you know, go big or go home, you know? (laughs) So, Ruying, back to your story, you told me that you have a good support system, which is your sister. Mm. And that's very true, actually, for someone facing depression. It's not easy to get out of it, especially if if you don't have anybody to turn to, you know, because you are isolating. And for people like this, Ruying, let's say they don't exactly have a support system, maybe, right? Mm. What do you think they should do, though? Good question, mm. uh, Dina, because like, like we've talked about, you know, depression is isolating mm. um, and, you know, you're, you're going through it alone. It's in your head. People don't see that. It's impossible to go through it alone. And a lot of times we are taught that depression or like mental health disorders, it's something that's shameful. It's something that you shouldn't have. It's something what's wrong with you, basically, mm. for having it. But that is not how you tackle it. Right? How about let's give it a rebranding and let's just talk about it like it's it's just a normal sickness. You know, you wouldn't shame someone for getting the flu. You wouldn't shame someone for getting COVID. You know, why would you shame someone for getting depression? Because it's just a sickness of the mind. Mm. And so how to counter effect, uh, counter-attack it? I wouldn't... I don't like giving out generic advice, okay. but I would say that definitely you have to start somewhere. It has to start with you and you have to start recognizing that you are not alone in this. Mm. Because what depression is trying to tell you, like I told you, right, like imagine there's this 
shadow depression version of yourself that's telling you, hey, you, you know, you're alone in this. You suck. You don't deserve nice things. You are everything bad that you, you know, you've ever thought of. And it's so isolating. But the it truth is, is, that's not the truth. Mm. It's just a shadow version telling you that. So you need to fight back and you need to tell yourself, hey, look, that's just factually incorrect. Even if it may seem as if I am alone in this, no, one's a, no one understands me, no one's supporting me, that is simply not the truth. So... In a way, it's like, you know, gaslighting yourself to just, like, think otherwise. But oh my God, I'm not gaslighting saying... yourself. Like, that's true, that's true, though. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you can I'm not recommending you. that. I'm not recommending mm-hmm. that. But it's sort of like, you need to recognize that first, number one. Mm-hmm. And then the second thing is, that's when you tell someone about it. That's when you have to, even though you don't have that um, support system, you, you in your head, you believe that you don't have that support system. Shadow version of yourself is telling you you don't have that support system. Not true, you can always make one. You don't have to have it like preset your family la, and all these kind of things. La. It's not it's not a given. You have to make your own support system. So first thing, recognize it. Second thing, talk about it. Ask someone that you trust for help. That's, that's from Ruying and thank you. That's a great advice, by the way. Yeah. But um, I would just say this. Taking yeah. action is really important, guys. Yeah. If you don't do anything about it, that's how you get stuck in the loop. Facts, uh, facts. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of times that depression really drags you down. It's such a heavy thing to carry. And But the moment that you break that mm. and take the first step, and the first step is always the hardest. So once you break out of it, then that's when you realise that, hey, maybe things are not so different after all. Mm. You know, um, I don't know if you have heard of that story or that the description of like these two wolves in your mind so one is the bad wolf and one is the good wolf Mm. so which wolf and they're constantly in battle right so which wolf are you feeding are you feeding the good one or are you feeding the bad one Mm. because then that would indicate their strength and that would indicate how many times they win the battle so let's try to do some things take the first action to see what it's like to feed the good wolf Mm. and then you will feel the the impact from there lah Okay, okay, Ring. Uh, let's wrap up uh, okay. this episode with one final question. Okay. What advice would you give to someone battling depression? First advice I would give, I think, is just to open up. Mm-hmm. Let someone, let just someone, just one person will do to like see, to have a look into your heart, look into your head, what is going on there. And make sure that this someone is someone who is healthy for you, right? Not just go back to your toxic you know, X and then be like, oh, you know, I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, not good. Don't, don't do that. So just find someone who's healthy. Find someone you can trust and open up and let them know, hey, this is, this is what's going on inside. And it's hard because you're going through shame. You're going through, you know, all these things that are telling you not to do it. But really, if there's someone who's good for you, they will not judge you. Um, and they will, in fact, be able to support you through it. So, Ruying, mm. actually, I... I just remember something important. What do you think about going to therapy? 100% recommended to to see a professional, uh, to seek professional help. I've seen counsellors since, actually since I was 17, like after I've got out of swimming and then I wasn't sure what I was going to do with my life, feeling depressed. Mm. Same thing, I was displaying the same symptoms, you know, going Wait, to... Which counsellor though? What counsellor in the school or like... So I went to the one that was provided by the government. Um, mm. I actually went to Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Um, I saw... So what you do is you go through the outpatient, you go to visit the doctor and uh, in that session you can tell the doctor to give you a referral to see a psychiatrist mm. and or you want to see a counsellor. So what usually happens is that they will refer you to the psychiatrist first so that they can, the psychiatrist can give you a proper diagnosis. And from there, then only then they will sort of uh, give you the, the referral to go see a counsellor. Quite a few steps here. See the doctor, get a referral, see the psychiatrist, and then see a counsellor. But I went through it. And honestly, I'm very, very happy that I did. And thanks to my parents who came around and also supported me through it. Lah. How was it like though? Because I've never been, and I'm mm. sure people who have never been are curious about it as well. How was the process like and was it easy? 
honestly, like what you say, unfortunately, not a lot of people do that in Malaysia, right? To mm. to seek for professional help because it's somehow, again, embarrassing, something wrong with you, quote unquote. Um, you've lost your mind, something like that. But the, the truth is, again, if we think about it like a sickness, you know, if you're, you know, if you have COVID or you have like some more serious like flu or, or even like you you have cancer, you see a doctor for it. So if you're depressed, you see a counselor for it. It's very, very normal. And um, how was it like? It was, I would say that the role of a therapist was to give you a perspective that you've never thought of. Mm. So it's not that their role is to help you and give you advice. And, and I think that's what a lot of people think, right, in Malaysia. It's like, oh, yeah, no, I think they, <laughs> you just sit there, you tell them your problem, they give you answers that you already know the answers to. And then that's about it, you know, then you pay the money and then that's it. But that's not the case. A good counsellor or a good therapist is someone who listens to you who listens to what you need in that moment because what you need is different all the time, right? Mm -hmm. They listen to what you need and then they just sort of talk about it from a dis different perspective. They just give you a different perspective to think about the same problem, you know? And, for, and then it's up to you whether you want to take action or whether you want to just stay, sort of stay the same as you are. So that was my experience with um, therapy. I'm curious though, how much, how much did you pay for it? Was it free because it's from it's from the government? From the government, it's free. Oh, it's Hell free. Yeah. Or is it because of your age? No, um, um, it, I think it's a free service. Uh, you will have to pay the normal, I think, outpatient fee. It's like one ringgit, two ringgit. Oh. And then uh, psychiatrist, I think it's also like maybe five ringgit. How long did you wait for it, for your turn to be called? Good question. I think my appointment was maybe... Uh, three months like I had to wait for it for the first time okay. but they will have to it depends also on how serious they deem your condition to be la. if it's quite serious then of course they will bump you up make it faster a bit but please don't do it on purpose la. I have been to um, private uh, NGOs counselling mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. so these I you can choose two different types of counsellors the first type is the trainees which are master students, masters in counselling students who are mm. having to fulfil their training hours, right? Mm. So they are supervised by their uh, lecturers or the professionals. And the second type is the professionals themselves, those who have already gotten the licence to, to do counselling and these kind of things. Um, obviously, with the training, it's much cheaper. The one that I'm going to cost uh, 50 ringgit per session. Mm. So it's still okay if you're going, you know, maybe once or twice a month, this kind of thing. Um, but if it's going to the professional one, of course, then the price bumps up a bit, lah, quite a bit, from 150 to 200 per session. But just, you know, give it a try. The first therapist may not be the right person for you. Just like how you're seeing a doctor, the first doctor may not be the right person for you. Get second opinion. To wrap up the important points here, because we're talking about depression, and depression is not something that we should take lightly. In order to help out, people who are really affected. Just remember the steps that we discussed here. And first of all is, I think what's really important is to be aware of it. Yes. Sometimes you're not even aware of the situation until people tell you, hey, you're not how you used to be. Facts. Mm -hmm. And number two, get help. Yes, it is getting help. Um, just find any sources that could help you out. Listen to shop. <laughs> Listen to us and find a friend, get that support system, whoever it is that you trust, you just need to find someone. And if you don't have someone, believe in yourself. Go to therapy. Yeah, go to therapy. It's okay to, f to seek help. It's, it doesn't mean that, oh, no, no, no one's going to accept me with me being uh, diagnosed. It's not like that. It's not like that at all. The journey is not one fit for all. Lah. Mm. So really just whatever it is, just try to take care of yourself, I would say. Do what is best for you and learn to recognize what is best for you. So to our dear listeners, our viewers, uh, hit that like button. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on the Shock app. And hey, we will always be there. Finding Your Power will always be there next week. So stay tuned. And remember, whatever it is that you're going through, you got this. You got this.